Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Restorative Breast Collaboration virtual event. This evening, we have two presenters, Dr. Danielle Lipoff, breast surgeon, Bay State Breast Surgical Oncology and Breast Specialist, and Dr. Casey Collins, plastic surgeon, Bay State Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and I would like to thank particularly Dr. Lipoff and Dr. Collins for sharing their expertise this evening. Dr. Lipoff? Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you so much for setting up this event. Uh, really excited to get this started. In case nobody heard me, Sue, thank you so much for setting this up. Thank you for all the work that went into this. Really excited to present this to everybody tonight. So oncoplastic surgery, an aesthetic approach to breast cancer care. So I'm going to touch upon the history of breast cancer surgery and then go into oncoplastic surgery, what it is, the patient-centered approach, and the different techniques. But of course, before we can talk about where we've been, we have to talk about, one more time, <laughs> before we talk about where we are and where we're going, we have to talk about where we've were. So the goals of surgery have always been to eliminate the cancer with the least amount of deformity. Uh, in the United States, there's over 300,000 women who are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. This means that three and a half million survivors live their full lives with the effect of treatment. And because survivorship is becoming more commonplace, the attention is now being placed on the cosmetic results of our surgical treatment. So let's talk about where we've been. The first mention of breast surgery was found in Egypt. It was mentioned by Imhotep in 20, 2650 in the before common era by, he was an Egyptian physician. He described a bulging mass in the breast. He treated it with cautery or burning and described it as, as an ailment resistant to known therapies. As time moved on, Hippocrates came into the picture. He was described as the father of medicine. Interestingly enough, he was described as the father of medicine because he rejected the belief that disease was caused by supernatural forces. He described breast cancer as being associated with the, the cessation of menstruation, leading to breast engorgement and induration of the nodules. As we started to move out of the before common era and into the common era, Aurelius Celsus described the stages of cancer. He described early cancer, cancer without ulcer, ulcerated cancer, and ulcerated cancer, which bled easily. In the three later stages, he felt that any involvement with the cancer was something that should be avoided because any time they cut into the cancer, it would just grow back and felt that any involvement with the cancer just led to an earlier demise. As we moved forward into the second century, Leonides was the first person to describe operative treatment. It was right around that time that surgical instruments were created. He described incising and cauterizing the breast and the tumor until both were completely removed. And this was the practice as breast cancer treatment up until the 17th century. In the 1500s, Andreas Vesalius revolutionized the study of medicine with detailed descriptions of anatomy based on his cadaveric study. And he advised for excision of the breast for treatment of the cancer. Ambrose Pare was the first person to describe the association of swelling of the axillary glands or the glands under the arm and its association to breast cancer. But it wasn't until the 18th century when Francois Ledran was the discussed the lymphatic spread worsening breast cancer prognosis. And then finally comes in Dr. William Halstead. In 1894, he developed the concept of the radical mastectomy. At the time, he believed that the cancer was spread, spread through the bloodstream, which we now know is not the case, but thought that local removal of the tumor could cure the cancer and more was better. So the first radical mastectomy was performed at Roosevelt Hospital in New York in 1882. This involved a removal, removal of the entire breast, all of the breast tissue, removal of the pectoralis muscle or that main chest muscle, removal of all of the lymph nodes under the arm and all of the lymph nodes up by the collarbone. This also included removal of all of the skin requiring a skin graft. And this of course caused significant disfigurement in women. 
This is a picture of a woman who had undergone a Halstead radical mastectomy. As you can see, the muscle is gone, the breast is gone, the skin is gone. This change in coloration here is where the skin graft was. And that incision went all the way up into the armpit to include all of those lymph nodes. This surgery had widespread adoption by the medical community and was performed for the next 70 years. The reason it was performed for so long is at the time, breast cancer survival was almost zero. And he found improve, a significant improvement in that survival. And at three years, the survival was 45%. That being said, still about a quarter of those patients who did not have positive lymph nodes still ended up dying from metastatic breast cancer or spread to breast cancer to the rest of the body. As we move forward into the 20th century, breast cancer surgery became far more radical before it became close to minimal. That being said, I'm not gonna go into those details because it is quite drastic. Fortunately, it never became the standard of care. Then in 1895, x-rays were discovered. Emil Grub was the first person to use radiation for a breast cancer. Jeffrey Keynes in 1922 applied radium needles to breast cancers that he deemed inoperable. Then after World War II, external beam radiation was developed and that was really the game changer. Robert Woodier in 1948 was the first person to treat a simple mastectomy with radiation. And when I say simple mastectomy or total mastectomy, that phraseology just means removal of the breast and the skin. So no lymph nodes were taken and the muscle was not taken. And what he found was a five-year survival of 62%. So then change really happened. The National Surgical Adjuvant treatment of breast and bowel really revolutionized the, the breast care, the breast cancer care. From the years of 1977 to 1985, two significant trials came out, the BO4 and the BO6. The BO4 looked at the difference between radical mastectomy or that mastectomy described by Dr. Halstead and total mastectomy, just removal of the breast. And it was found that the overall survival between the two was completely the same. And in BO6, the, they looked at mastectomy versus breast conservation, and again, discovered that the overall survival, once radiation was included, was completely the same. And this proved that there was no difference in survival with lumpectomy combined with radiation when looking at it versus mastectomy. The trials here in this seven-year period also rationalize the multidisciplinary approach to breast cancer care, which is how we treat all of our cancer patients now. So now as we start to look at the modern era of breast cancer care, our two main options for treatment of breast cancer are lumpectomy or breast conservation, which is a surgical removal of the cancer or specifically the tumor from the breast with a small amount of normal breast tissue surrounding it. A mastectomy is removal of all of the breast tissue, sometimes all of the skin and sometimes the nipple, but not necessarily always. The next piece to the discussion about surgical care is management of the axillary nodes. Now, in regards to that, I'm not gonna go into the details of axillary nodes because it's an entire other can of worms that we are not gonna discuss tonight. So the breast conservation concept. When we started to look at breast cancer concert, breast conservation, we knew it was important to allow the breast cancer to keep her breast while still decreasing the risk of recurrence, using radiation as part of that strategy to minimize the risk, and that the post-treatment breast should have an acceptable cosmetic appearance while still paying being mindful of the emotional needs of the patients. In regards to mastectomy, of course, there is an ultimate risk reduction, but it's a much larger surgery. It has a significant psychological impact on the patient, and it may allow patients to avoid radiation, although not necessarily. This option can be performed with or without reconstruction, and reconstruction can occur at the same time as a surgery or delayed. 
So when looking at local recurrence risk between breast conservation versus mastectomy, they are different, although quite close. That being said, the overall survival, regardless of surgery, is exactly the same. Now, newer studies have started to come out that are really looking at the recurrence rates when we look at the same tumors comparatively. And what we're finding is the recurrence rates are more likely similar when we look at lumpectomy versus mastectomy, because it'll be much more based on the type of tumor and the type of breast cancer as to whether or not recurrence will happen. We're also starting to learn that there may be improved survival with breast conservation for stage one breast cancers. So now we know that both options are safe, but both options at the time had issues with their final aesthetic outcomes. In comes oncoplastic surgery. Oncoplastic surgery was part of our techniques starting in the early 80s, but the term itself wasn't coined until 1994 when Werner Austrich started to talk about the aesthetic cancer cure. He published a paper using this term and really started to create the niche that oncoplastic surgery is. I've also listed several other surgeons, including Mel Silverstein, Gail Leibovic, Scott Spear, Krishna Klaw, and Cicero Urban, who have all been really founders and trailblazers in this field. But oncoplastic surgery combines the skills of the cancer surgeon and the plastic surgeon. The simple terminology is that the cancer surgeon should, the cancer should be treated surgically by effectively removing the cancer while simultaneously maintaining or improving the cosmetic appearance of the breast. And of course, these techniques can be used to mastectomy as well as uh, breast conservation. But of course, that's the simple answer. There's much more dynamic decision-making that goes into oncoplastic surgery, and every patient is approached differently. First, we have the initial assessment of the patient's existing anatomy, the size and shape of their breast, as well as the patient's satisfaction with the size and shape of their breast. Some women are happy with the breast and shape they have. Others have been waiting for a reduction for a really long time. Next comes in the piece about the size of the cancer. How large is the cancer? How much tissue is to be removed? And is, in the, is the cancer in more than one place within the breast? Then, of course, the, what's the skill set necessary to achieve our optimal results? Another paper came out to discuss the five variables, the five S variables of oncoplastic surgery, which include the site, the size, the skin, how much skin can be removed in the process of the surgery, the shape of the breast, and of course, symmetry, because we don't want to forget the other side. In oncoplastic surgery, it's divided into two levels of procedures. Level one procedures are usually resection of less than 20% of the breast. This is something that I can do myself within the surgery without the assistance of my colleague, Dr. Collins. This involves local tissue rearrangement, and of course, the most important piece of scar planning, which brings me to an interesting point uh, to discuss is that the entire Bay State system has now been deemed a system of excellence for hidden scar surgery because it is such a big piece of what we do for oncoplastics and how we care for our patients. So what does hidden scar mean? Hidden scar is really the foundation of oncoplastic surgery in hiding the scars along the normal lines of the breast tissue to give the patient the best outcome possible. So the three options we look at are in the upper outer quadrant by the armpit, around the areola, here in option two, or under the breast completely hidden. This patient here has had an incision out here on the outside of her areola, and it's something we can't even see. And by maintaining the normal planes of the breast, we give we already set ourselves up for success to allow our patients to heal well. And it's something that all of the surgeons here at Bay State are trained in to perform these hidden scar procedures. This is the next piece of those level one procedures. And this is, I mentioned the removal of skin. So we have the breast in the middle here and we have all of these different areas pointing to the different locations of the tumors. These are a little bit more complicated than the normal procedures done within a day-to-day, -day, um, operative day within the uh, 
for each of my patients. But it does give us the different options that we can use to remove some tissue to allow the nipple to end up center to maintain the normal contours of the breast and to allow us to remove the tissue necessary to appropriately treat the cancer. The next piece of the discussion are the level two procedures. These are the advanced techniques. This requires resection of up to 50% of the breast volume. And these are the cases that are performed by the cancer surgeon as well as the plastic surgeon. As I mentioned previously, this may also include contralateral breast reshaping. So that's a quick overview of all things oncoplastics from my viewpoint. Thank you, Dr. Lipoff, for that uh, outstanding presentation. It's um, you know always really interesting to go back and see you know where we started, how we got got to this kind of amazing place uh, that we are in currently, um, and it's certainly uh, you know very um, exciting and and super advanced relative to uh, where we started, uh, and that's undoubtedly due to um, innovative thinkers like you. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, um, I think when I meet with, uh, with patients and I think about, or we think collectively about their uh, treatment process, I think we like to think that it will be something similar to this. So, you know, they'll be kind of uh, receive the diagnosis, go through the, uh, you know, uh, the operative and also the medical treatment process and then uh, recover. And, uh, you know, that will kind of end things uh, for them. And we like to think of it in this simple um, linear fashion. But I think that, you know, in, in meeting and developing relationships with patients, we realize that a lot of times it feels a little bit more like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, the reason for that is because I think, as, as Dr. Lipoff mentioned, we are in such an advanced place uh, at this moment in time, uh, and we have the benefit of having all these different specialists and different uh, minds thinking about uh, the disease process in this way. Uh, but sometimes that can kind of, you know, bring us through kind of, um, uh, you know, ups and downs or, or a nonlinear path, if you will. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a matter of kind of balancing these things. But I just wanted to point out that I am one member of this massive team. Um, and uh, I know it can get confusing as a patient to kind of think about uh, all the information you're getting from, uh, from different sources. So I just wanted to um, hopefully provide a bird's eye view of how a plastic, plastic surgeon thinks about um, not only the reconstructive process, but also the whole uh, treatment process for uh, any given patient. And I think uh, our jobs as plastic surgeons, uh, rather than, you know, most of the team is dedicated towards addressing, uh, you know, the, the malignancy or the problem or the disease. And I think our, our goal and our job is maybe slightly different. We're certainly intertwined with that, but um, we're focused uh, very much on the, um, you know, physical uh, uh, and emotional um, improvement of our patients uh, and, and well-being of our patients. And so that uh, is where uh, we uh, spend most of our time thinking and problem solving. So um, these are a lot of the things that I think about when I meet with somebody and we consider our reconstructive approach. So I think about Dr. Lipoff's operative plan and what ultimately might be missing, um, what you know, layers of tissues, how much volume, and um, in, in those uh, sorts of things as they relate to uh, human anatomy. I also uh, try and get a sense of, the, of anyone's, uh, any patient's goals uh, throughout, the, um, throughout their care process and their reconstructive process. Um, and these can be, uh, certainly, there, there are a vast number of um, different desires depending on 
uh, certain situations, personalities, et cetera. Uh, and so I think the important thing here is that we, uh, as a team, try and provide a very tailored approach. And we do that by getting to know our patients uh, very well. I think anatomically, certainly, as Dr. Lipoff alluded to, uh, breast size and shape are, uh, are extremely important in terms of understanding um, uh, what pathway we should follow in our reconstructive process. Um, prior operations are important, uh, incisions, and thinking about uh, the overall tissue health and the patient's health. And then finally, um, whether or not there's a need for uh, additional therapies such as chemotherapy or, or radiation uh, is important. Um, so in terms of thinking about uh, the different types of breast reconstruction, it can be very complicated uh, for anyone, uh, certainly for uh, you know, medical students, providers, and most definitely for patients. It's just a complicated topic, so I tried to uh, simplify it a little bit. So the larger types of, of uh, breast reconstruction, so you have implant-based, which is a breast implant, um, and then uh, you have one's own uh, tissues that you can use, and we call this autologous reconstruction. And then when you get into kind of one's, using one's own tissues, you can do a total breast reconstruction or a partial breast reconstruction. Um, and the partial breast reconstruction uh, is essentially what Dr. Lipoff uh, had, um, had mentioned and reviewed uh, a little bit in her presentation, and that is also known as an acoplastic reconstruction. And this is kind of the area of, of surgery where um, you know, you have a, you're removing part of the breast, you're removing the tumor, um, but uh, you know, you're also reconstructing that area. Um, so it's not uh, a total mastectomy, um, and it's not simply a lumpectomy because you are reconstructing it. And so this is the area of oncoplastic surgery, which has become really interesting and uh, really innovative uh, in recent years. And so the names of these that are on the slide uh, certainly uh, don't matter in many ways, but I think the, the concepts are important and the colors are important. So uh, what we try and do in, uh, you know, as a team and as oncoplastic surgeons is we think about, okay, where, uh, where on the breast is the defect? Where is the volume missing? Um, and then also, where is the blood flow coming in? And is there tissue that we can use to kind of help create um, or fill this, this area that is missing uh, some of the breast tissue or the breast volume? And, you know, sometimes there are very uh, excellent options for this. And these kind of uh, this color diagram represents uh, a few of them in the, the ways that we think uh, as surgeons. Uh, this is another example uh, of uh, additional tissue that might be used in an oncoplastic reconstruction. This would be used uh, for more of a superior breast uh, defect, and you can uh, essentially uh, slide this piece of tissue uh, with its blood supply um, into that area uh, where there's a deficiency of, of uh, the breast tissue, uh, skin, and uh, anything else that you need to replace. Um, and then finally, as Dr. Lipoff also mentioned, uh, the, um, we can often provide for patients who uh, would like to have additional volume reduced or change uh, the uh, we call it ptosis when the breast droops a little bit, but change the height of their nipple or their breast tissue. Uh, we can offer uh, oncoplastic reductions. Um, and, you know, this is a removal of skin. It's a removal of tissue, often with the malignancy or the lesion of concern. Um, and then we bring everything back together um, in a way that allows the breast to be reshaped. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been a, a really powerful tool that we've been able to use uh, over the years. And so with that, uh, I would love to take any questions, and I know Dr. Lipoff would as well. Um, I've listed our number uh, for the Breast Health and, and Wellness Center on the left, and 
uh, certainly if any uh, 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 questions come up later on, uh, feel free to uh, pay us a visit and uh, meet with us in the clinic. It might be beneficial to talk through how, how we would approach a patient, a patient who would come into my office. Um, so I, let's say I have a young woman comes in, found to have a, a stage one breast cancer. So breast cancer under two centimeters in size. Um, things I'm going to look at, is it located in just one place in the breast? Is it located in more than one place in the breast? Based on the imaging, I'm going to get a general sense of how large a woman's breast is and where within the breast it lies and which of the four quadrants of the breast. Because anytime I approach the the breast tissue, I know that there are certain areas that I can take more volume and certain areas where I can't take as much. And that's based on the anatomy, of course, in the upper inner quadrant and the upper portion of the chest. It's much harder to get a lot of volume and still maintain the normal shape and contour of the breast. The studies say anywhere from 10 to 15 percent volume removal may actually cause a significant de deformity within the breast itself. So I keep that in mind um, prior to going into meeting with the patient and, of course, um, pending all other concerns about chemotherapy or other treatments. We'll put that on the back burner and say that's not part of the conversation for this particular um, discussion. So I get an idea of what the breast cancer itself looks like, an idea of what the breast shape looks like, and then I go in and meet the patient. And I'll do my exam determine where it lies within the breast, the type of breast tissue. Um, I know Dr. Collins mentioned the ptosis and how much the breast droops or where the nipples point. If it's they're pointing straight out, if they're pointing closer to the floor, it's going to change my planning. It's also going to change the possibility of oncoplastic reconstruction versus not. And then with patients with larger breasts, I'll generally ask the question, how do you feel about the size and shape of your breasts? And a lot of the times I'll get the answer of, I've always wanted to reduction. I always feel that my breasts are too large. I have neck pain, I have back pain. And one of the options that we can offer these patients with larger breasts is the op option of the oncoplastic reduction, where I remove the cancer, do my cancer portion of the surgery, and Dr. Collins will then reduce the size of both breasts. This is mutually beneficial all around. We get larger tissue taken out for the breast cancer, meaning larger margins, meaning I'm less concerned about any cancer being left behind. And the patients get smaller breasts, which is what they wanted to begin with prior to the cancer diagnosis. Then the other piece for women with smaller breasts, I can then determine where along the body, the where along the breast the cancer lies, and are there other pieces of tissue that I can use to pull in. Um, some women have extra tissue out in this area here, out on the side of their chest, that I can use to pull in a little bit. But at some point, there's only so much rearrangement of the tissue that I can do to allow for a good reconstruction. And at that point, if I have a woman with smaller breasts with a much larger mass, that I know that I can't recreate the breast despite all of the tricks in my bag, I then forward the patient or refer the patient to Dr. Collins, we'll then have the next stage of discussion. And I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Collins. Great. Right. Thank you. Um, that was an awesome overview. And also we're having, uh, we have a few amazing questions that are coming in. So I'll just, um, uh, it's not a complete redirection, but somebody asked, okay, during total breast reconstruction, uh, using the patient's own tissue, where is the other tissue coming from? So phenomenal question. Uh, there are a lot of answers to that, but I would say the most common is, is usually a DIEP flap, which is essentially when we use uh, someone's abdominal tissue, uh, remove it um, along with its blood supply and uh, transfer it up uh, as a breast reconstruction. Uh, and that's uh, uh, called, you know, in plastic surgery language, a free flap uh, breast reconstruction. There are other options for locations, but I would say the, uh, the abdomen is, is probably the most common for a free flap. 
Um, if you're keeping uh, the vascular supply intact, uh, the other options, there is an abdominal option and also um, a back muscle option. So the latissimus um, are, are fairly common. So that's uh, usually where the, the tissue comes from. And sometimes those are those uh, those total breast reconstructions with someone's own tissue are combined with a small implant, for example, to improve overall projection um, of the of the breast mound. Um, I think one other question uh, that came up, which is a great question, uh, where does use of cadaver tissue come into the process? So. Um, perhaps it will help if I, well, yeah, let me just show this slide again, uh, because I think it may help a little bit. So we talked a lot about partial breast reconstruction and oncoplastic reconstruction, but um, I didn't talk a lot about implant-based reconstruction. So usually the, cada the cadaver skin comes into play um, often with implant-based reconstruction, and it serves as a kind of covering or an extra layer around uh, the implant, uh, which we place uh, at the time of implant placement, essentially. So we, we wrap the implant in that, um, oftentimes, uh, and typically, we start with a tissue expander. Um, and later on, once the tissue expander has created enough space, uh, we will switch over uh, to a, a silicone or a saline implant. But that's where that, uh, the, the quote unquote, uh, ADM or acellular dermal matrix or cadaver skin uh, will come into play. Um, another really excellent question came in um, in regards to um, a patient who has already had a lumpectomy uh, looking to do an overall reduction in making her breasts more symmetric. So I do want to add one piece, and I'll definitely hand the question over to you, Dr. Collins, because it is your field. But any symmetrizing procedure for patients who have been diagnosed with breast cancer is covered by insurance. So that's generally a question that may follow in this. So that's always nice to know going into these discussions. So, Dr. Collins? Mm. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, the, so I, so I think, you know, this, this um, is not uncommon and, you know, we uh, certainly do this. I think, um, you know, it's always really important, I will say, uh, for anyone who's thinking about, you know, having a reduction or, a, you know, a, a procedure for symmetry, um, it's really important to just be up to date on all appropriate, you know, cancer screening uh, and guidelines. You know, if, if you're followed by a surgical oncologist or an oncologist to be meeting with them uh, before embarking on uh, on that, on the 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 symmetry, uh, the procedure for symmetry, essentially. But um, in terms of recovery time, uh, which was uh, part of the question, I think that, um, you know, everyone recovers a little bit differently. I think that people often, after a reduction, experience, they certainly experience pain, but people often have less pain than they anticipated. Um, and also, uh, you know, after about, two weeks, I find that a lot of my patients start to feel uh, a lot better. And it's it's just, you know, it's a process. It's, you don't wake up one day and uh, magically feel uh, totally different. You just kind of incrementally each day feel a little bit better. But um, I do find that that kind of two week threshold is pretty important for patients in terms of turning the corner. Um, Okay, another uh, really good question. So what determines whether or not a patient gets a reconstruction the day of mastectomy or having to wait until a later date? So uh, that is a really, uh, there are a lot of, of um, different variables that go into that calculus. Usually there's a, uh, you know, typically we have a, a pretty 
uh, narrow and tailored plan in place before the operation, but uh, we always have a few um, different uh, scenarios, even on the day of the operation. Um, so I think, you know, a few things that, that play into that are, uh, you know, sometimes it's the patient, it's someone's overall health is important. Uh, sometimes it's how their tissues and their skin respond to the uh, initial operation or the mastectomy um, and whether or not, you know, we're worried about the health of the tissue or whether or not um, it seems like it's getting uh, excellent blood flow. Uh, so the, all those things matter. Um, you know, I always, before we plan any sort of reconstruction, uh, you know, Dr. Lipoff, uh, we can't forget that um, addressing the cancer and the lesion is the most important thing. And so, um, you know, I'm always in discussion with her before we come up with some sort of reconstructive plan, because we want to make sure that we uh, have our priorities uh, in place and address the, the cancer uh, first. Um, so those are some of the things that kind of play into the decision making. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a few others regarding, uh, you know, certain anatomy um, uh, and, and those sorts of things. But it's a pretty tailored approach uh, each time. And we think a lot of, about a lot of different variables collectively. So another question just came in about how my approach changes um, in regards to lumpectomy versus mastectomy in the different stages of breast mm -hmm. cancer. Um, and you know that the it's an excellent question, and it really is a multi-layered approach in regards to that. And I first uh, want to make mention that um, in patients with smaller cancers, again, I want to go back to the fact that the overall survival between these two options are the same, meaning that patients in these scenarios, especially in these stage one cancers, get the choice between a mastectomy versus a lumpectomy. And in smaller cancers, you know, we have a lot more leeway uh, of how to, to treat them. And uh, stages is a, a sticky topic of conversation because it used to just be a discussion about the size of the cancer and whether or not the lymph nodes are involved, which is not necessarily the case anymore. Um, and what I always tell my residents is when we're looking at breast cancer care and the surgical care of patients, the treatment surgically of the breast is in one category and the treatment of the axilla and the armpit and those lymph nodes are in another category. So the size of the tumor in the breast is uninvolved surgically and how I approach the surgery with what I'm going to do in the axilla surgically. And the reason I make that clarification is that's where the stage falls in, because I may have a patient who has a small tumor and multiple lymph nodes involved who's technically a stage two, but how I'm going to treat the armpit is not how I'm going to treat the breast if the cancer's small enough. So I just want to make that clarification. So I'm going to answer the question from the terms of the size of the cancer. So it absolutely does change my approach in regards to the size of the cancer and how it corresponds to the size of the patient's breast. Um, even women with large breasts, if they have cancer filling up 60% of their breast, which I have absolutely seen, unfortunately, despite our best efforts between myself and Dr. Collins, there's not much we can do to save the normal shape and contour of the breast. So from a cancer standpoint, it becomes the safest option to then proceed with the mastectomy. Because ultimately what I wanna do is make sure we do the right cancer surgery, meaning taking out all of the cancer and having those negative margins so there's no cancer left behind. And when we're looking at these larger areas of cancer, at some point, the decision for mastectomy does have to be made. But in regards to lumpectomy, um, actually, there was a point I want to go back to uh, in stage. There is a certain type of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer, uh, which is a really aggressive uh, advanced stage and at that point, all bets are off. And unfortunately, the surgical planning for that, the decision is made. It is a mastectomy. It is removal of all of the lymph nodes. And that is generally done without reconstruction because of the, the sequelae of the treatments that happen after the fact. 
Now that being said, so I made the discussion about um, a breast encompassing having 60% replaced by cancer. So if I have a woman with larger breasts who has the same size cancer, let's say six inches of cancer within the breast or a six inch area with a really large breast, we can proceed with a lumpectomy from my standpoint, doing it with an oncoplastic reduction with Dr. Collins. Or a woman with a smaller breast having a two and a half, three centimeter tumor, maybe golf ball size or larger, and using a localized advancement flap, which was the colorful picture he saw he used using the picture out laterally, the tissue out laterally, or the tissue underneath the breast to bring in vitalized tissue to reconstruct that area. So uh, it is the answer is yes, my approach changes, but it's a multifactorial decision. And it really, it really is different for every single patient. I hope that answered it for you. Well, thank you both very much for a great event. And I appreciate your time and your expertise and answering all those great questions. You thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you'll join us next week for the discussion on mammography with Dr. Jennifer Hadro. Thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.